Section 24 A few feet away, a strapping great lad in livery stood musing, motionless, statuesque, useless, like that purely decorative warrior whom one sees in the most tumultuous of Montaigne's paintings, lost in dreams, leaning upon his shield, while all around him are fighting and bloodshed and death. Detached from the group of his companions, who were thronging about Swann, he seemed as determined to remain unconcerned in the scene, which he found vaguely with his cruel, greenish eyes, as if it had been the massacre of the innocents, or the martyrdom of St. James. He seemed precisely to have sprung from that vanished race, if indeed it ever existed, save in the Riridas of San Zeno and the frescoes of the Aramitani, where Swann had come in contact with it, and where it still dreams, fruit of the impregnation of a classical statue by some one of the master's Paduan models, or of Albert Durer's Saxons and the locks of his reddish hair, crinkled by nature, but glued to his head by brilliantine, were treated broadly as they are in that Greek sculpture which the Mantuan painter never ceased to study, and which, if in its creator's purpose it represents but man, manages at least to extract from man's simple outlines such a variety of richness borrowed, as it were, from the whole of animated nature, that a head of hair, by the glossy undulation and beak-like points of its curls, or in the overlaying of the florid triple diadem of its brushed tresses, can suggest at once a bunch of seaweed, a brood of fledgling doves, a bed of hyacinths, and a serpent's writhing back. Others, again, no less colossal, were disposed upon the steps of a monumental staircase, which, by their decorative presence and memorian immobility, was made worthy to be named, like that god-crowned descent in the palace of the doges, the staircase of the giants, and on which Swann now set foot, saddened by the thought that Odette had never climbed it. Ah, with what joy would he, on the other hand, have raced up the dark evil-smelling breakneck flights to the little dressmakers, in whose attic he would so gladly have paid the price of a weekly stage-box at the opera, for the right to spend the evening there when Odette came. And other days, too, for the privilege of talking about her, of living among people whom she was in the habit of seeing when he was not there, and who, on that account, seemed to keep secret among themselves some part of the life of his mistress, more real, more inaccessible, and more mysterious than anything that he knew. Whereas, Upon that pestilential, enviable staircase to the old dressmakers, since there was no other, no service stair in the building, one saw in the evening outside every door an empty, unwashed milk-can set out, in readiness for the morning round, upon the doormat. On the despicable, enormous staircase which Swann was at the moment climbing, on either side of him, at different levels, before each anfractuosity made in its walls by the window of the porter's lodge, or the entrance to a set of rooms, representing the departments of indoor service which they controlled, and doing homage for them to the guests, a gatekeeper, a major-domo, a steward, worthy men who spent the rest of the week in semi-independence in their own domains, dined there by themselves like small shopkeepers, 
and might to-morrow lapse to the plebeian service of some successful doctor or industrial magnate scrupulous in carrying out to the letter all the instructions that had been heaped upon them before they were allowed to don the brilliant livery which they wore only at long intervals in which they did not feel altogether at their ease stood each in the arcade of his doorway their splendid pomp tempered by a democratic good fellowship like saints in their niches and a gigantic usher dressed swiss guard fashion like the beadle in a church struck the pavement with his staff as each fresh arrival passed him coming to the top of the staircase up which he had been followed by a servant with a pallid countenance and a small pigtail clubbed at the back of his head like one of goya's sacristans or a tabellion in an old play swann passed by an office in which the lackeys seated like notaries before their massive registers rose solemnly to their feet and inscribed his name he next crossed a little hall which just as certain rooms are arranged by their owners to serve as the setting for a single work of art from which they take their name and in their studied bareness contained nothing else besides displayed to him as he entered it like some priceless effigy by benvenuto cellini of an armed watchman a young footman his body slightly bent forward rearing above his crimson gorget an even more crimson face from which seemed to burst forth torrents of fire timidity and zeal who as he pierced the aubusson tapestries that screened the door of the room in which the music was being given with his impetuous vigilant desperate gaze appeared with a soldierly impassibility or a supernatural faith an allegory of alarums incarnation of alertness commemoration of a riot appeared to be looking out angel or sentinel from the tower of dungeon or cathedral for the approach of the enemy or for the hour of judgment swann had now only to enter the concert room the doors of which were thrown open to him by an usher loaded with chains who bowed low before him as though tendering to him the keys of a conquered city but he thought of the house in which at that very moment he might have been if odette had but permitted and the remembered glimpse of an empty milk-can upon a doormat wrung his heart he speedily recovered his sense of the general ugliness of the human male when on the other side of the tapestry curtain the spectacle of the servants gave place to that of the guests but even this ugliness of faces which of course were mostly familiar to him seemed something new and uncanny now that their features instead of being to him symbols of practical utility in the identification of this or that man who until then had represented merely so many pleasures to be sought after boredoms to be avoided or courtesies to be acknowledged now that their features were at rest measurable by aesthetic coordinates alone in the autonomy of their curves and angles and in these men in the thick of whom swann now found himself packed there was nothing even to the monocle which many of them wore and which previously would at the most have enabled swann to say that so and so wore a monocle which no longer restricted to the general connotation of a habit the same in all of them did not strike him with a sense of individuality in each 
perhaps because he did not regard General de Froberville and the Marquis de Briot, who were talking together just inside the door, as anything more than two figures in a picture, whereas they were old and useful friends who had put him up for the jockey club and had supported him in duels. The general's monocle, stuck like a shell splinter in his common, scarred, victorious, overbearing face, in the middle of a forehead which it left half-blinded, like the single-eyed flashing front of the cyclops, appeared to Swan as a monstrous wound, which it might have been glorious to receive, but which it was certainly not decent to expose. While that which M. de Briot wore, as a festive badge, with his pearl-gray gloves, his crush-hat, and white tie, substituting it for the familiar pair of glasses, as Swann himself did, when he went out to places, bore glued to its other side, like a specimen prepared on a slide for the microscope, an infinitesimal gaze that swarmed with friendly feeling, and never ceased to twinkle at the loftiness of ceilings, the delightfulness of parties, the interestingness of programs, and the excellence of refreshments. Hello, you here? Why, it's ages since I've seen you, the general greeted Swan, and noticing the look of strain on his face, and concluding that it was perhaps a serious illness that had kept him away, went on, "'You're looking well, old man,' while M. de Briot turned with, "'My dear fellow, what on earth are you doing here?' to a society novelist who had just fitted into the angle of eyebrow and cheek his own monocle, the sole instrument that he used in his psychological investigations, and remorseless analyses of character, and who now replied with an air of mystery and importance, rolling the R, I am observing. The Marquis de Forestel's monocle was minute and rimless, and, by enforcing an incessant and painful contraction of the eye over which it was encrusted, like a superfluous cartilage, the presence of which there was inexplicable, and its substance unimaginable. It gave to his face a melancholy refinement, and led women to suppose him capable of suffering terribly when in love. But that of M. de saint girdled like Saturn with an enormous ring, was the centre of gravity of a face which composed itself afresh every moment in relation to the glass, while his thrusting red nose and swollen sarcastic lips endeavoured by their grimaces to rise to the level of the steady flame of wit that sparkled in the polished disc, and saw itself preferred to the most ravishing eyes in the world by the smart, depraved young women whom it set dreaming of artificial charms, and a refinement of sensual bliss. And then, behind him, M. de Palancy, who, with his huge carp's head and goggling eyes, moved slowly up and down the stream of festive gatherings, unlocking his great mandibles at every moment, as though in search of his orientation, had the air of carrying about upon his person only an accidental, and perhaps purely symbolic fragment of the glass wall of his aquarium, a part intended to suggest the whole which recalled to Swann, a fervent admirer of Giotto's vices and virtues at Padua, that injustice by whose side a leafy bough evokes the idea of the forests that enshroud his secret lair. Swann had gone forward into the room, 
under pressure from Madame de saint Duvert, and in order to listen to an aria from Orfeo, which was being rendered on the flute, and had taken up a position in a corner from which, unfortunately, his horizon was bounded by two ladies of uncertain age, seated side by side, the Marquise de Cambremer and the Fricontesse de Francto, who, because they were cousins, used to spend their time at parties in wandering through the rooms, each clutching her bag and followed by her daughter, hunting for one another like people at a railway station, and could never be at rest until they had reserved, by marking them with their fans or handkerchiefs, two adjacent chairs. Madame de Combremy, since she knew scarcely anyone, being all the more glad of a companion, while Madame de Francto, who on the contrary was extremely popular, thought it effective and original to show all her fine friends that she preferred to their company that of an obscure country cousin with whom she had childish memories in common. Filled with ironical melancholy, Swann watched them as they listened to the pianoforte inter, meso, Liszt's St. Francis preaching to the birds, which came after the flute, and followed the virtuoso in his dizzy flight. Madame de Francto, anxiously, her eyes starting from her head, as though the keys over which his fingers slipped with such agility were a series of trapezes, from any one of which he might come crashing a hundred feet to the ground, stealing now and then a glance of astonishment and unbelief at her companion, as who should say, "'It isn't possible. I would never have believed that a human being could do all that.' Madame de Combermay, as a woman who had received a sound musical education, beating time with her head, transformed for the nonce into the pendulum of a metronome, the sweep and rapidity of whose movements from one shoulder to the other, performed with that look of wild abandonment in her eye which a sufferer shows who is no longer able to analyze his pain, nor anxious to master it, and says merely, I can't help it, so increased that at every moment her diamond earrings caught in the trimming of her bodice, and she was obliged to put straight the bunch of black grapes which she had in her hair, though without any interruption of her constantly accelerated motion. On the other side, and a little way in front of Madame de Francto, was the Marquise de Gallardon, absorbed in her favorite meditation, namely upon her own kinship with the Germant family, from which she derived both publicly and in private a good deal of glory, not unmingled with shame the most brilliant ornaments of that house remaining somewhat aloof from her, perhaps because she was just a tiresome old woman, or because she was a scandalous old woman, or because she came of an inferior branch of the family, or very possibly for no reason at all. When she found herself seated next to someone whom she did not know, as she was at this moment next to Madame de Franco, she suffered acutely from the feeling that her own consciousness of her Germant connection could not be made externally manifest in visible character like those which, in the mosaics in Byzantine churches, placed one beneath another, inscribe in a vertical column by the side of some sacred personage, the words which he is supposed to be uttering. At this moment she was pondering the fact that 
she had never received an invitation, or even call from her cousin, the Princesse de Lhomme, during the six years that had already elapsed since the latter's marriage. The thought filled her with anger, and with pride, for by virtue of having told every one who expressed surprise at never seeing her at Madame de Lhomme's, that it was because of the risk of meeting the Princess Mathilde there, a degradation which her own family, the truest and bluest of the legitimists, would never have forgiven her. She had come gradually to believe that this actually was the reason for not visiting her young cousin. She remembered, it is true, that she had several times inquired of Madame de Lhomme how they might contrive to meet, but she remembered it only in a confused way, and, besides, did more than neutralize this slightly humiliating reminiscence by murmuring, After all, it isn't for me to take the first step. I am at least twenty years older than she is and, fortified by these unspoken words, she flung her shoulders proudly back until they seemed to part company with her bust, while her head, which lay almost horizontally upon them, made one think of the stuck-on head of a pheasant which is brought to the table regally adorned with its feathers. Not that she in the least degree resembled a pheasant, having been endowed by nature with a short and squat and masculine figure, but successive mortifications had given her a backward tilt, such as one may observe in trees which have taken root on the very edge of a precipice, and are forced to grow backwards to preserve their balance." since she was obliged, in order to console herself for not being quite on a level with the rest of the Guermant, to repeat to herself incessantly that it was owing to the uncompromising rigidity of her principles and pride that she saw so little of them. The constant iteration had gradually remoulded her body and given her a sort of bearing, which was accepted by the plebeian as a sign of breeding, and even kindled, at times, a momentary spark in the jaded eyes of old gentlemen in clubs. Had any one subjected Madame de Gardon's conversation to that form of analysis which, by noting the relative frequency of its several terms, would furnish him with the key to a ciphered message, he would at once have remarked that no expression, not even the commonest forms of speech, occurred in it nearly so often as at my cousin's the Germant, at my aunt Germant's, Elzir the Germant's health, my cousin Germant's box, if any one spoke to her of a distinguished personage, she would reply that, although she was not personally acquainted with him, she had seen him hundreds of times at her aunt Germant's, but she would utter this reply in so icy a tone, with such a hollow sound, that it was at once quite clear that if she did not know the celebrity personally, that was because of all the obstinate, ineradicable principles against which her arching shoulders were stretched back to rest, as on one of those ladders on which gymnastic instructors make us extend, so as to develop the expansion of our chests. At this moment the Princesse de Lhomme who had not been expected to appear at Madame Saint-Hubert's that evening, did, in fact, arrive. 
to show that she did not wish any special attention, in a house to which she had come by an act of condescension, to be paid to her superior rank, she had entered the room with her arms pressed close to her sides, even when there was no crowd to be squeezed through, no one attempting to get past her, staying purposely at the back, with the air of being in her proper place, like a king who stands in the waiting procession at the doors of a theatre, where the management have not been warned of his coming, and strictly limiting her field of vision, so as not to seem to be advertising her presence, and claiming the consideration that was her due, to the study of a pattern in the carpet, or of her own skirt. She stood there on the spot which had struck her as the most modest, and from which, as she very well knew, a cry of rapture from Madame de saint Hubert would extricate her as soon as her presence there was noticed, next to Madame Combremay, whom, however, she did not know. She observed the dumb show by which her neighbour was expressing her passion for music, but she refrained from copying it. This was not to say that, for once that she had consented to spend a few minutes in Madame de saint Hubert's house, the Princesse de Lome would not have wished, so that the act of politeness to her hostess, which she had performed by coming, might, so to speak, count double, to show herself as friendly and obliging as possible. But she had a natural horror of what she called exaggerating, and always made a point of letting people see that she simply must not indulge in any display of emotion that was not in keeping with the tone of the circle in which she moved, although such displays never failed to make an impression upon her by virtue of that spirit of imitation akin to timidity which is developed in the most self-confident persons by contact with an unfamiliar environment, even though it be inferior to their own. She began to ask herself whether these gesticulations might not, perhaps, be a necessary concomitant of the piece of music that was being played, a piece which, it might be, was in a different category from all the music that she had ever heard before, and whether to abstain from them was not a sign of her own inability to understand the music, and of discourtesy towards the lady of the house, with the result that, in order to express, by a compromise, both of her contradictory inclinations in turn, at one moment she would merely straighten her shoulder straps, or feel in her golden hair, for the little balls of coral, or of pink enamel, frosted with tiny diamonds, which formed its simple but effective ornament, studying, with a cold interest, her impassioned neighbour, while at another she would beat time for a few bars with her fan, but, so as not to forfeit her independence, she would beat a different time from the pianists. When he had finished the list intermezzo, and had begun a prelude by Chopin, Madame de Combremay turned to Madame de Franteau with a tender smile, full of intimate reminiscence, as well as of satisfaction, that of a competent judge, with the performance. She had been taught in her girlhood to fondle and cherish those long-necked, sinuous creatures, the phrases of Chopin, 
so free, so flexible, so tactile, which begin by seeking their ultimate resting place somewhere beyond and far wide of the direction in which they started, the point which one might have expected them to reach, phrases which divert themselves in those fantastic by-paths, only to return more deliberately, with a more premeditated reaction, with more precision, as on a crystal bowl which, if you strike it, will ring and throb until you cry aloud in anguish to clutch at one's heart. Brought up in a provincial household with few friends or visitors, hardly ever invited to a ball, she had fuddled her mind in the solitude of her old manor house, over setting the pace, now crawling slow, now passionate, whirling, breathless, for all those imaginary waltzing couples, gathering them like flowers, leaving the ballroom for a moment to listen, where the wind sighed among the pine trees on the shore of the lake, and seeing, of a sudden, advancing towards her, more different from anything one had ever dreamed of than earthly lovers are, a slender young man, whose voice was resonant and strange and false in white gloves. But nowadays the old-fashioned beauty of this music seemed to have become a trifle stale. Having forfeited some years back the esteem of really musical people, it had lost its distinction and its charm, and even those whose taste was frankly bad had ceased to find in it more than a moderate pleasure to which they hardly liked to confess. Madame de Combermay cast a furtive glance behind her. She knew that her young daughter-in-law, full of respect for her new and noble family, except in such matters as related to the intellect, upon which having got as far as harmony and the Greek alphabet, she was specially enlightened, despised Chopin, and felt quite ill when she heard him played. But finding herself free from the scrutiny of this Wagnerian, who was sitting at some distance in a group of her own contemporaries, Madame de Combermay let herself drift upon a stream of exquisite memories and sensations. The Princesse de Lhomme was touched also. Though without any natural gift for music, she had received, some fifteen years earlier, the instruction which a music mistress of the Faubourg Saint-Germain, a woman of genius who had been towards the end of her life, reduced to penury, had started at seventy, to give to the daughters and granddaughters of her old pupils. This lady was now dead. But her method, an echo of her charming touch, came to life now and then in the fingers of her pupils, even of those who had been in other respects quite mediocre, had given up music, and hardly ever opened a piano. And so Madame de Lhomme could let her head sway to and fro, fully aware of the cause, with a perfect appreciation of the manner in which the pianist was rendering this prelude, since she knew it by heart. The closing notes of the phrase that he had begun sounded already on her lips, and she murmured, How charming it is, with a stress on the opening consonants of the adjective, a token of her refinement by which she felt her lips so romantically compressed, like the petals of a beautiful budding flower, that she instinctively brought her eyes into harmony, illuminating them for a moment with a vague and sentimental gaze. Meanwhile, Madame de Gallardon had arrived at a point of saying to herself 
how annoying it was that she had so few opportunities of meeting the princesse de l'homme for she meant to teach her a lesson by not acknowledging her bow she did not know that her cousin was in the room a movement of madame franco's head disclosed the princess at once madame de gallardon dashed towards her upsetting all her neighbors although determined to preserve a distant and glacial manner which should remind every one present that she had no desire to remain on friendly terms with a person in whose house one might find oneself any day cheek by jowl with the princess mathilde and to whom it was not her duty to make advances since she was not of her generation she felt bound to modify this air of dignity and reserve by some non-committal remark which would justify her overture and would force the princess to engage in conversation and so when she reached her cousin madame de gallardon with a certain countenance and one hand thrust out as though she were trying to force a card began with how is your husband in the same anxious tone that she would have used if the prince had been seriously ill the princess breaking into a laugh which was one of her characteristics and was intended at once to show the rest of an assembly that she was making fun of some one and also to enhance her own beauty by concentrating her features around her animated lips and sparkling eyes why he's never been better in his life and she went on laughing madame de gallardon then drew herself up and chilling her expression still further perhaps because she was still uneasy about the prince's health said to her cousin orion at once madame de l'homme looked with amused astonishment towards an invisible third whom she seemed to call to witness that she had never authorized madame de gallardon to use her christian name i should be so pleased if you would look in just for a minute to-morrow evening to hear a quintet with the clarinet by mozart i should like to have your opinion of it she seemed not so much to be issuing an invitation as to be asking a favour and to want the princess's opinion of the mozart quintet just as though it had been a dish invented by a new cook whose talent it was most important that an epicure should come to judge but i know the quintet quite well i can tell you now that i adore it you know my husband isn't at all well it's his liver he would like so much to see you madame de gallardon resumed making it now a corporal work of charity for the princess to appear at her party the princess never liked to tell people that she would not go to their houses every day she would write to express her regret at having been kept away by the sudden arrival of her husband's mother by an invitation from his brother by the opera by some excursion to the country from some party to which she had never for a moment dreamed of going in this way she gave many people the satisfaction of feeling that she was on intimate terms with them that she would gladly have come to their houses and that she had been prevented from doing so only by some princely occurrence which they were flattered to find competing with their own humble entertainment and then as she belonged to that witty germant set in which there survived something of the alert mentality stripped of all commonplace phrases and conventional sentiments which dated from mary may 
and found its final expression in the plays of Miac and Alevi. She adapted its formula so as to suit even her social engagements, transposed it into the courtesy which was always struggling to be positive and precise, to approximate itself to the plain truth. She would never develop at any length to a hostess the expression of her anxiety to be present at her party. She found it more pleasant to disclose to her all the various little incidents on which it would depend whether it was or was not possible for her to come. Listen, and I'll explain, she began to Madame de Gallardon. Tomorrow evening I must go to a friend of mine who has been pestering me to fix a day for ages. If she takes us to the theatre afterwards, then I can't possibly come to you much as I should love to. But if we just stay in the house, I know there won't be anyone else, so I can slip away. Tell me, have you seen your friend, Monsieur Swann? No, my precious Charles, I never knew he was here. Where is he? I must catch his eye. It's a funny thing that he should come to old saint Duvers, Madame de Gallardon went on. Oh, I know, he's very clever, meaning by that very cunning, but that makes no difference. Fancy a Jew here, and she the sister and sister-in-law of two archbishops. I am ashamed to confess that I am not in the least shocked said the princesse de lome i know he's a converted jew and all that and his parents and grandparents before him but they do say that the converted ones are worse about their religion than the practicing ones that it's all just a pretense is that true do you think i can throw no light at all on the matter the pianist, who was down to play two pieces by Chopin, after finishing the prelude, had at once attacked a polonaise. But once Madame de Gallardon had informed her husband that Swann was in the room, Chopin himself might have risen from the grave and played all his works in turn, without Madame de Lombe's paying him the slightest attention. She belonged to that one of the two divisions of the human race, in which the untiring curiosity which the other half feels about the people whom it does not know is replaced by an unfailing interest in the people whom it does. As with many women of the Faubourg Saint-Germain, the presence in any room in which she might find herself of another member of her set, even though she had nothing in particular to say to him, would occupy her mind to the exclusion of every other consideration. From that moment, in the hope that Swann would catch sight of her, the princess could do nothing but, like a tame white mouse when a lump of sugar is put down before its nose, and then taken away, turn her face in which were crowded a thousand signs of intimate connivance, none of them with the least relevance to the sentiment underlying Chopin's music, in the direction where Swann was, and, if he moved, divert accordingly the course of her magnetic smile. Orion, don't be angry with me, resumed Madame de Gallardon, who could never restrain herself from sacrificing her highest social ambitions, and the hope that she might one day emerge into a light that would dazzle the world, to the immediate and secret satisfaction of saying something disagreeable. People do say about your Monsieur Swann that he's the sort of man one can't have in the house. Is that true? Why, 
you, of all people, ought to know that it's true, replied the Princess de Lome, for you must have asked him a hundred times, and he's never been to your house once. And leaving her cousin mortified afresh, she broke out again into a laugh which scandalized everyone who was trying to listen to the music, but attracted the attention of Madame de saint Hubert, who had stayed, out of politeness, near the piano, and caught sight of the princess now for the first time. Madame de saint Hubert was all the more delighted to see Madame de Lome, as she imagined her to be still at Germant, looking after her father-in-law, who was ill. "'My dear princess, you here? Yes, I tucked myself away in a corner, and I've been hearing such lovely things. What, you've been in the room quite a time? Oh, yes, quite a long time, which seemed very short. It was only long because I couldn't see you. Madame de saint Hubert offered her chair to the princess, who declined it with, Oh, please, no. Why should you? It doesn't matter in the least where I sit. And, deliberately picking out so as the better to display the simplicity of a really great lady, a low seat without a back. There now, that hassock, that's all I want. It will keep my back straight. <clears throat> oh, good heavens, I'm making a noise again. They'll be telling you to have me chucked out. Meanwhile, the pianist having doubled his speed, the emotion of the music lovers was reaching its climax. A servant was handing refreshments about on a salver, and was making the spoons rattle, and as on every other party night, Madame de saint Hubert was making signs to him, which he never saw, to leave the room. A recent bride, who had been told that a young woman ought never to appear bored, was smiling vigorously, trying to catch her hostess's eye, so as to flash a token of her gratitude, for the others having thought of her in connection with so delightful an entertainment. And yet, although she remained more calm than Madame du Franteau, it was not without some uneasiness that she followed the flying fingers. What alarmed her, being not the pianist's fate, but the pianos, on which a lighted candle, jumping at each fortissimo, threatened, if not to set its shade on fire, at least to spill wax upon the ebony. At last she could not contain herself any longer, and, running up the two steps of the platform on which the piano stood, flung herself on the candle to adjust its sconce. But scarcely had her hand come within reach of it, when, on a final chord, the piece finished, and the pianist rose to his feet. Nevertheless, the bold initiative shown by this young woman, and the moment of blushing confusion between her and the pianist which resulted from it, produced an impression that was favorable on the whole. "'Did you see what that girl did just now, Princess?' asked General de Froberville, who had come up to Madame de Lome, as her hostess left her for a moment. "'Odd, wasn't it? Is she one of the performers?' No, she's a little Madame de Combremay, replied the princess carelessly, and then with more animation. I am only repeating what I heard just now, myself. I haven't the faintest notion who said it. It was some one behind me who said they were neighbors of Madame de saint Hubert in the country, but I don't believe anyone knows them, really. They must be country cousins. By the way, I don't know whether you're particularly well up in the brilliant society which we see before us, 
because I've no idea who all these astonishing people can be. What do you suppose they do with themselves when they're not at Madame de saint Hubert's parties? She must have ordered them in with the musicians, and the chairs, and the food. Universal providers, you know. You must admit they're rather splendid, General, but can she really have the courage to hire the same supers every week? Is it possible? Oh, but Combermay is quite a good name. Old, too, protested the General. I say no objection to its being old, the princess answered dryly. But whatever else it is, it's not euphonious, she went on, isolating the word euphonious, as though between inverted commas, a little affectation to which the Germant set were addicted. You think not, eh? She's a regular little peach, though, whose eyes never strayed from Madame de Combremay. Don't you agree with me, Princess? She thrusts herself forward too much. I think in so young a woman that's not very nice, for I don't suppose she's my generation, replied Madame de Lhomme, the last word being common, it appeared, to Gallardon and Germant and then seeing that M. de Froberville was still gazing at Madame de Combremay, she added half out of malice towards the lady, half wishing to oblige the general, not very nice for her husband. I am sorry that I do not know her, since she seems to attract you so much. I might have introduced you to her, said the princess, who if she had known the young woman, would most probably have done nothing of the sort. And now I must say good night, because one of my friends is having a birthday party, and I, I must go and wish her many happy returns, she explained, modestly and with truth, reducing the fashionable gathering to which she was going to the simple proportions of a ceremony which would be boring in the extreme, but at which she was obliged to be present, and there would be something touching about her appearance. Besides, I must pick up Bassin. While I've been here, he's gone to see those friends of his, you know them too, I'm sure, who are called after a bridge. Oh, yes, the Aenas. It was a battle before it was a bridge, princess. It was a victory, said the general. I mean to say to an old soldier like me, he went on, wiping his monocle and replacing it as though he were laying a fresh dressing on the raw wound underneath, while the princess instinctively looked away. That empire nobility, well, of course it's not the same thing, but after all, taking it as it is, it's very fine of its kind. There were many people who really did fight like heroes. But I have the deepest respect for heroes, the princess assented, though with a faint trace of irony. If I don't go with Bassin to see this Princesse d'Aina, it isn't for that at all. It's simply because I don't know them. Bassin knows them. He worships them. Oh, no, it's not what you think. He's not in love with her. I've nothing to set my face against. Besides, what good has it ever done when I have set my face against them? She queried sadly, for the whole world knew that, ever since the day upon which the Prince de Lhomme had married his fascinating cousin, he had been consistently unfaithful to her. Anyhow, it isn't that at all. Their people he has known for ever so long. They do him very well, and that suits me down to the ground. But I must tell you what he's told me about their house. It's quite enough. Can you imagine it? All their furniture is en pierre. But, my dear princess, that's only natural. It belonged to their grandparents. 
I don't quite say it didn't, but that doesn't make it any less ugly. I quite understand that people can't always have nice things, but at least they needn't have things that are merely grotesque. What do you say? I can think of nothing more devastating, more utterly smug, than that hideous style. Cabinets covered all over with swans' heads, like bath-taps. But I believe all the same that they've got some lovely things. Why, they must have that famous mosaic table, which the treaty of— Oh, I don't deny. They may have things that are interesting enough from the historic point of view. But things like that can't ever be beautiful, because they're simply horrible. I've got things like that myself that came to Bassin from the Montesquieu's. Only they're up in the attics at Germant, where nobody ever sees them. But, after all, that's not the point. I would fly to see them with Bassin. I would even go to see them among all their sphinxes and brasses if I knew them. But I don't know them. Do you know, I was always taught when I was a little girl that it was not polite to call on people one didn't know. She assumed a tone of childish gravity. And so I am just doing what I was taught to do. Can't you see those good people with a totally strange woman bursting into their house? Why, I might get a most hostile reception. And she coquettishly enhanced the charm of the smile which the idea had brought to her lips by giving to her blue eyes, which were fixed on the general, a gentle, dreamy expression. My dear princess, you know that they'd simply be wild with joy. No, why? She inquired with the utmost vivacity, either so as to seem unaware that it would be because she was one of the first ladies in France, or so as to have the pleasure of hearing the general tell her so. Why, how can you tell? Perhaps they would think it the most unpleasant thing that could possibly happen. I know nothing about them. But if they're anything like me, I find it quite boring enough to see the people I do know. <laughs> I'm sure if I had to see people I didn't know as well, even if they fought like heroes, I should go stark mad. Besides, except when it's an old friend like you, whom one knows quite apart from that, I'm not sure that heroism takes one very far in society. It's often quite boring enough to have to give a dinner party, but if one had to offer one's arm to Spartacus to let him take one down, really, no, it would never be Vercingetorix I should send for to make a fourteenth. I feel sure I should keep him for really big crushes, and as I never give any, ah, uh, princess, it's easy to see you're not a Germant for nothing. You have your share of it, all right, the wit of the Germant. But people always talk about the wit of the Germant. I never could make out why. Do you really know any others who have it? She rallied him with a rippling flow of laughter, her features concentrated, yoked to the service of her animation, her eyes sparkling, blazing with a radiant sunshine of gaiety, which could be kindled only by such speeches even if the princess had been able to make them herself, as were in praise of her wit or her beauty. Look, there's Swan talking to your Cambrame woman, over there, beside old saint Hubert. Don't you see him? Ask him to introduce you, but hurry up. He seems to be just going. Did you notice how dreadfully ill he's looking? asked the general. My precious Charles! Ah! He's coming at last. I was beginning to think he didn't want to see me.